Hello. How are y'all doing? Hmm, okay. Me too. <laughs> okay, give me just a second. Or actually, let me first say thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everyone here at the festival. Thanks, all of you, for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and a quick caveat. As you heard in my bio, I live in New York, and I'm Nigerian, so I have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of things to say. <laughs> And I speak quickly. So if you find that I'm speaking really quickly, just kind of wave at me and I will slow down. Great. Great. Okay, so um, I want to start us off with a story. So specifically, this is a story that I wrote about a year and a half ago when I was working for the Internet Publication Courts. Uh, the story says, side-by-side -side images expose a glitch in Google's Maps. And what the story is about is how for all of the location-based data that Google has, and all of you know, Google has a lot. If you've ever used Google Maps, you know this. Uh, despite all of that, there are still places that don't show up on the map. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. Uh, you'll see here, that's satellite imagery. Uh, this is how we can tell that these places don't show up, because we have the aerial imagery. But then on the other side is the map data. And you can see the vast difference between the two. Uh, so this is Makoko. It's this floating uh, lake lagoon. It's off the coast of Lagos. I've been there. People estimate, estimate about 100,000 people live there. It could be more. Um, but as you can see, it shows up as pretty much all blank space on the map. Here's another one. We're still in the continent of, Af of Africa. Uh, this, is, this is Chad. Uh, this is a Lake Feature drainage basin. And that is really just one little pocket of a larger space that involves about two million people who live there. You can see there's virtually nothing, nothing there. So maybe you're getting the idea of what these are going to look like. <laughs> Here's one more. Uh, this one is from uh, the Gobi Desert. This is in Mongolia. Uh, this is an area that is really sparse. It's really remote. It's very difficult to get to. And we see the same story play out. And here's the last one. This one is actually my favorite, and I'll explain to you why in a little bit. Uh, but this is in Rio. This is in Brazil. And so this is Moro dos Prazeres. Excuse my pronunciation if you are Brazilian and speak Portuguese. Uh, and once again, we don't see very many. But in fact, with this one, we have a tiny bit of a difference. I don't know if you can tell in the bottom right corner. But there are some, there are a few sort of like houses that you can kind of see, right? So there's a little bit more with this one, which we'll come back to in a second. Uh, so the question is, what is actually happening here? What are we seeing? So this, you might think this is a story about Google, but actually it's not. This isn't about Google trying to erase any communities or trying to make places invisible. We know this for a fact because actually Google has spent a lot of resources trying to map areas that, are, um, that don't show up on the map. And the reason why I bring up this example of the favelas or why I end with it is because Google has put a lot of money specifically into the favelas, which is why we can see a little bit here. Uh, Google has even gone so far as to design special equipment that are just so that they can try to map these areas. And they partnered with local, um, local nonprofits in Rio ahead of the 2016 Summer Olympics so that they could try to, again, map these areas. Even still, only 2% of favelas in Rio are mapped. The other way that we know that this isn't a problem of Google alone is that Google's not the only place that has mapping software and mapping data. So there are other places, for example, OpenStreetMap, if you've ever heard of that. It's this open source, crowdsourced uh, way of generating map data. So anybody can use it. It's non-proprietary. But if you look there, you will see, once again, pretty much the same story. So the question is, what is this? What's happening? What does this mean? I would say that what we're witnessing here is a tension. And what we're witnessing is a space that is illegible to the systems of data collection that we have today. And so what I like to think of this, uh, this as is that we are witnessing the implications of our machine-readable world. And specifically, what happens if you don't really fit that world? So when I say our machine-readable world, what I'm referring to is something that all of you probably are already aware of, uh, the fact that we are collecting more data now than we ever have before. Uh, and basically, everything is data. Anything you do on a device, on your phone, anything that's internet-enabled, ena anything that can be tracked, all of that is a data stream. All of that is data. And we use that data so that we can feed it into programs and to computers and to machines so that they can make sense of it and then do things that will make us be more efficient with that. And that, you know, that's great. That's a really wonderful thing. Uh, but as you can see, there are tensions that can arise from that if you don't fit those spaces. And I think that while it's easy for us to kind of know that this is happening, once we look at places like this, they sort of remind us of it in a more visceral way. 
Uh, so I said that this is one of my favorite examples. The reason why it is, is actually because of how I found out about this whole, this whole story, which is through this. Uh, this is a story that's written in one of the major newspapers in Sao Paulo. It's written by this academic, Ronaldo Lemos, uh, this Brazilian academic who's wonderful and who figured out uh, that when Pokemon Go first came out, people in the favelas couldn't play it. And oh, also Pokemon Go, just to remind you all, in case you don't remember, augmented reality game, people in the streets, car crashes, I don't know, people like with their phones out, you know, this whole story, it's Pokemon Go. Um, so he realized people in the favelas weren't playing it, and the reason for that was that the company that created Pokemon Go, Niantic Inc., the people who worked there actually used to work at Google. And so in the initial iteration of the game that they released, they used underlying map data from Google. So if you don't show up in Google's maps, you're not gonna show up in anything that is built on top of that. Right, so you think something as seemingly trivial as a game like Pokemon Go, you would think that this wouldn't like, point out any other like, bigger repercussions in the world, but of course it does. And we can imagine, we can just extrapolate and think about something like autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. If you don't show up on the map, there's no way that you're gonna show up in any maps for autonomous cars. So what does that mean? What does that tell us? Okay, let's take a step back. Like I said, my name is Mimi. Uh, I wear a lot of different hats. I usually describe myself as an artist and a researcher, but in fact, I have been, ah, I have been described as a lot of these different things. Uh, really, I'm pretty agnostic to what term uh, people use to describe me. Mostly, I kind of sit in a lot of different spaces and I do a lot of hybrid work. Uh, and really what I try to do is to create a piece of work and use a lot of different perspectives so that I can pull apart different nuances within the work. And I'm gonna show you if, and a couple examples of what I mean by this. And really, all of my work is about this thing that I told you about. Actually, let me go back for a second. Um, this thing I told you about, this idea of uh, this living in a more quantified society than we ever have lived in before and what that really means. And so one of the things that's on this list is educator. I'm currently at, I usually I'm at NYU, but this year I'm at Olin College of Engineering, uh, working there as like an artist and educator. And one of the things that I uh, have made my students read this year is uh, this piece by Neil Postman, who's a sometimes controversial thinker and theorist, uh, who talks about, who has this really wonderful piece actually, about five things we need to know about technological change. And this is one of the things that he says. Embedded in every technology, there is a powerful idea. And what Postman says is that this idea is so powerful that it's fundamental to actually understanding the technology, but it's so fundamental that we take it for granted. And so the example that he uses is in an oral culture, you prioritize memory. So you have to because how else are you going to pass down stories? But this also gives us, uh, helps us understand why bards and poets in oral cultures are so highly regarded. They have this ability to be able to remember and to have, just remember these long, these long poems. But then, additionally, you think about a writing-based culture. And in those cultures, all of a sudden, logical organization and structure become really important. Because all of a sudden, now you have this ability to step back and reflect on an argument and look at it from start to finish. So then the question becomes, in a moment like now, where we have computers everywhere, and where they've moved from our desks to our pockets, to our clothing, to our homes, to our streets, what is the powerful idea that's packaged within them? What is the thing that we prioritize? And the answer, I would say, is data. Everything has to be made into data so that it can be fed to these computers. Um, but of course, there are a lot of things implied in this process of feeding data to computers. And I think often uh, it's very easy to forget because once you have a data set, then you, you just kind of can work with it and you don't have to think about how it came about. You don't have to think about how it was collected. No data just appears. In fact, it has to be cr created. It has to be collected. And so for a long time, uh, I've tried to create works that could really piece this apart or really disentangle this and allow us to think about what are those terms? What does that mean? What is packaged into this process of data collection that is so fundamental as to be powerful and so powerful that we take it for granted? So I'm going to tell you about a project I did a few years ago that really was intended to kind of help make sense of this. Uh, so this, this project was called Pathways. Um, this, I did this uh, fellowship. It was called the National, the Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellowship, which is quite a mouthful. Uh, I was in the inaugural class. This is all of us. I really include this photo because my mom says that I never dress in business professional, and this is the one proof that I do, so I like to show it to as many people as I can. <laughs> and so for this project, what I did was I went to London, 
and I worked with four different groups of people. Uh, and one of them was a group of coworkers, the other one was a group of roommates, another one was a long distance, a couple in a long distance relationship, and then the last one was this family. And what I did was I took on the role of being like a data company. So I collected a month's worth of their mobile data. And I did this for a number of reasons. One of the things I was really interested in is how we enter into these unspoken agreements all the time with data companies, or rather with, with just tech companies, where we agree to trade our data for some kind of service. And we don't really think about where that data is going. And especially in 2014, I don't think we're really thinking about this in kind of a mainstream way about what was happening with that. And so I wondered what could I, what could I possibly pull out that was interesting about that process by kind of taking on this role myself and convincing people to let me see their data. Uh, and along the way, I created these artifacts. I was doing this thing for National Geographic, so I made this, this sort of digital storytelling website that told the story of this data. So uh, I'll show you an example of the kind of things, the kind of things that I made. Uh, so this is one of the maps. I told you I worked with a group of coworkers. And so I collected their like, ge geolocation data, so people's GPS coordinates at various, pretty much constantly all through the day for a course of a month. Uh, this is a static image. On the actual website, this was animated. So it could play out over time. And what you could do is see over the course of a month where all three of these people were. And so that way you could kind of see like how they were spending their time with each other. And I should say, I should mention, every group that I did this with, they all kind of had this like meta question that they kind of wanted me to investigate. And this group, they were just curious about their, their friendship. And they were like, oh, are we really just work friends? Or are we friends outside of that? And I was like, okay, I guess I can look through your data and I think you might get this answer in a different way, but sure, I can try to answer it through your data, sure. Uh, and so on the version, you can kind of start to see it a little bit here, but on the version that actually is animated and plays out, you can see that the orange and the pink line, they spend way more time together than they do with the blue person. <laughs> you can see this, they, they like went on a trip together, the blue person didn't go. Um, and so there were some things that I could just pull out just by looking at the data, uh, but I also worked with every couple, I actually, every couple, I worked with every group, and I actually spent time with them, uh, and I will, I'll come back and talk about that experience is like. Uh, I didn't just collect geolocation data, I also collected uh, messages and like metadata. And so this is from the long distance couple. So this is when they're sending messages to each other. When I say I collected metadata, what I mean is I collected essentially everything but the content. So I didn't know what they were sending each other, but I knew what times they were sending, what platforms they were using, how they were responding to each other, how frequently, et cetera. And so this, you can see this is a, this is a chart that shows some of that information. Uh, you can see that there are two people. There's one person who's based in the UK, one person based in the US. Uh, you can see that the person who's based in the US messages far more, which having been an American in the UK, I can say that sounds, sounds appropriate. Uh, here's another one. I could split it up and also look at what exact uh, mediums they were using to message each other on. Uh, people often ask, you can see there's this week in the middle where they don't send any messages at all. Uh, the answer is not that they broke up, but that they were together, they were in the same place. Right, see, so there's no reason for them to be sending messages back and forth. So here is uh, the family, and the family was one of my favorite groups I worked with just because they had a very interesting situation going on. Uh, I collected their data in the two weeks before the birth of their first child, and then the first two weeks of that child's life. So this was sort of looking at the, what the data of a birth looks like for, and it was the mom and the dad, and then the, the mom of the mom, the grandmother of the child. And so this, uh, this family, I really appreciated working with them. I really enjoyed it because there was a lot that you could tell from this. And I was really interested in this idea of networked data collection. And what I mean by this is that, very interestingly, our data on its own, as an individual, you're just not really that important to a government, to a corporation. Uh, you just don't really matter. But as an aggregate, as a group, all of a sudden you're very important. And then now you can be used for trends and to predict things. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of show this on a very microcosmic level. And in the version that actually is animated, you can start to see this because you always know where the baby is. After the baby has been born, you always can tell where the baby is, even though, of course, I did not track any information about the baby. So again, this idea of the networked nature uh, of this moment that we're in, these, these platforms, the systems that we use. And then 
move on to the next one. Uh, this was the final group. These were roommates, uh, and they were interested. It was, was three of them. They had lived together for a long time, and one of them was leaving, and so they were really interested in what the data of their goodbye would look like, and so that is what I collected for them. And from, from this, I kind of walked away from this with two different, two different things. The first one, uh, two different realizations. The first was that by reinserting this relationship in data collection, and by that I mean highlighting the process where I was actually sitting with them, I was collecting the data, they were seeing me do that, and then they could see the things that resulted from that, but it was never divorced from the process that brought it about. All of a sudden it brought to light all of these questions around trust and like possession of data and ownership, all these things that we are talking about right now. The minute that that process was made visible, all of a sudden the people who were in it were very aware of it. And then the second thing is that I told you, all of these groups had questions that they wanted me to answer. And I was so deeply aware of the huge gap between the questions they wanted me to answer and uh, the data that I could collect. So they wanted to know about what the goodbye would be like. And I, I couldn't, I, like, I can't really answer that. Um, and I, you know, I was there, I was there for this goodbye, I was there for a lot of this stuff that was happening, but I was very intrigued by this, this chasm between what they thought they could get from the data versus what it actually could give them. And so I actually spent a long time thinking about that, thinking about that gap and what that gap really meant. And uh, afterwards, I returned to New York after I did this project, and I started working at uh, the Data and Society Research Institute, which of course is also based in New York, and I really could not get this idea off my mind, this idea of what could not be collected, what was missing. And so, after having done that project, I would say maybe about a year later, I started working on a project that I have been working on to this day, which is about missing data. So to me, missing data sets are blank spots in otherwise data-saturated spaces. And so by this, what I mean is that you'll have a space where lots and lots of data is being collected, uh, but then all of a sudden you'll notice that there's something that is missing. And so when I started thinking about this, I did two things. The first thing is I wrote up something, I put it on GitHub. GitHub is a code sharing site. It's really for programmers to be able to like, upload code and then you can easily download someone else's code and change it and do something else with it. I don't really like to use it for programming pur purposes. I like to use it for just thoughts, things I wanna get out into the public, but and sort of not quite super public, but a way where people can still respond to it and adjust and like, uh, have this kind of conversation with it. And so I posted something on GitHub posted this, and then I immediately started collecting missing data sets. I started collecting things that I was noticing were not being collected. So here is an abridged, and not updated list, I should say, because some of these no longer are missing. Uh, but this is a list of a bunch of missing data sets. And so there are a lot of things on this. Uh, this began to include things like the locations of all of Amazon's data centers, uh, the amount of American cash that is outside of uh, the US's borders, um, Information about web users that include VPNs, uh, various, all sorts of different things, things in all sorts of different fields. And I started by just collecting this list, but eventually I started to realize that the collection of the list was doing that thing that I had just been uh, responding to before, which was that somehow we tend to fetishize having the data, but what was far more important was the step that came before this, or what the data signified, what these artifacts were pointing to. Really, this question of why were these things missing? And so instead, I sort of started switching focus, and I started thinking about the reasons for these patterns of absence. So the question was, what are, why? Why are there missing data sets? And there are really four, four reasons why. So this is the first one. Uh, this is that often you will find that people who have the resources to collect something will lack the incentives to collect it. And this is the, the first example that even started me out on this project, uh, had to do with civilians killed by the police. So this, is, this typifies this, this reason perfectly. And now today, this isn't really a missing data set. We can say about how many civilians are killed by the police, but at the time when I was starting this, there was no real information on it. And the reason is because of just how much work it takes uh, to actually try to collect that if you are not uh, a law enforcement agent, agency, or really all law enforcement agencies, who could be able to collect that information much more easily, but then have no incentive to. So once this reason is for so many of the missing data sets that I was collecting, 
you started, you could see this is it, is this power asymmetry and this difference between who is able to collect something and who actually wants to have that out there. Here's the second one, which is that sometimes the act of collecting something is such a burden that it is not perceived to be worth what you think you'll get from having that data set. And the best example of this that I can give you all is uh, data around sexual assault and sexual harassment. This is something that we've seen playing out across the news um, in recent times. And you can see exactly how that works in that for a lot of people, the act of coming forward, the barrier to that is so high that you really have to feel like it's gonna, it's gonna give you something that is worth it. And if that barrier for some kind of data set, if you make it, if it's high enough, whether because of like legal reasons or structural reasons, societal, cultural, et cetera, it's high enough, then that is enough to kind of stop people from wanting it to exist, even if they think that having that data exists could be useful to others. This one you're all already familiar with because the thing that I first started us out with actually falls perfectly into this category, which is that there are some spaces that just resist the act of metrification. This act of turning the world into data is not easy and it's, it doesn't work for everything. And so those sites that I showed you at the beginning, those are a perfect example of this in that it's not that there's anything wrong with them, it's just that they resist the ways in which we, we quantify the world. Another really ex uh, interesting example of this I think you can find in cash. So credit card transactions generate data. You know, that's very easy to track. Uh, but in that exact same way, cash just eats up data, <laughs> cash transactions. Uh, and so it's really interesting because uh, in a world where it makes, where you can make money off of just being able to track things, cash is terrible for that. And it also, you know, now, now you can start to see, like in a lot of places you're getting cash phased out. This is the exact reason. It totally fits our world far better. It fits an automated society much more to not have cash in the picture. And then this final one is a little bit tricky in some ways, in that you can almost say that for nearly any missing any data set in general, there's a any missing data set there is a benefit to it not existing to it not existing. But when I say this, I mean more specifically. I already told you that there's this relationship of data collection, and there's the objects people who are collected upon, and often the subjects, the people who want to collect something. Uh, and usually what I mean is that there are these instances in which the people who are situationally disadvantaged will decide that they don't want some data out there because it is a way that it can help themselves. So it's like a, a, a protective strategy. And a really great example of this, you can see in, um, if you look at like mun municipal ID cards, so that like you have in San Francisco, like you have in New Haven, uh, these are cards that are intended to provide a document for undocumented people uh, so that they can really just have some like the rudimentary, just ways of kind of existing in society. And places in, in San Francisco, when they collect the data for this card, they actually immediately discard it. And they do this because that way, if anybody comes to them and says, we know that you're giving cards to undocumented people, we want to know who are you giving it to, just, or just give us our data about who, who this is going to, they can say, we don't have it. Sorry, we have nothing to give you. And so that act of not having data becomes actually a strategy. So this is part research project, but I also have found myself working with people. So people who are, they come to me and they say, we are missing data, and we want to do something about it. And so this is one of the groups that I worked with. Don't know if we have any Broadway fans in the room, but these are a group of Asian American Broadway performers. And they started realizing that they were not getting roles and seeing roles written for them at the same rate at which they felt that their counterparts were. And so they went together uh, and they, they spoke to some of the stakeholders in the theater community. And the response that they got was, you have no proof of this. So they were said, okay, well then let's see what we can do. And in doing so, they decided that, uh, they realized that there was no data about any of the ethnic or racial backgrounds of performers on Broadway stages. And so when they went back to the stakeholders and they brought this up, they said there is no data on this, the response, and at this point I was uh, with them at this stage in the process, so I can really attest to this, uh, the response was that it would be too difficult and inaccurate, potentially, to try to collect this data. However, there is very robust data on the demographics of audience members who go to these shows which is interesting because that's the group that you make money from, not the group that you pay. So, uh, so they started collecting all of this data 
And I, they did a fantastic job. They went back, collected five years' worth of data, and I only joined them at the very end of the process. And what I did was I helped them with some of the data uh, analysis, gathering it, cleaning it, and then also thinking about how we could tell the story. And so then I wrote this article, it still exists, it's still in courts, uh, wrote this article about the entire experience. And in this article, we talk about how the whole thing happened, and we include lots and lots of graphs and charts that explain exactly what they found. But this is really uh, the chart that I think is, is best for showing what happened, which is, here we go, this is the, uh, the race and ethnicity of performers for the 2014-15 season on Broadway. Asian Americans are represented by the light blue color, and you can see, indeed, they are only really highly represented in one show, The King and I which takes place in modern day uh, Thailand and has white main characters. So <laughs> they were able to prove exactly what they had, had thought was true. And um, this actually, as a tangent, something we found that was really interesting in looking at all the data that they collected is that this is kind of the way diversity unfolds across Broadway, is that it's not uh, in terms of like a mix, but rather in terms of individual shows. So The King and I was functioning as an Asian show, and then you can see Holler If You Hear Me, which was a short-lived Tupac uh, musical. That one was like the black show, you can see, that's what, right? And so, and then the rest are mostly like white shows, I guess. Uh, but there are some shows that challenge this. Oh, also I should say, and we, we realized that whenever times were tough, uh, those were the shows that were first cut. And then we realized that there are really, I think two shows that have actually successfully challenged this and been really diverse in terms of different types of people. One of those is Rent from the 90s, but we couldn't include here. We didn't have to, we couldn't go back that far to have that data. Uh, but the second one that was included is Hamilton. So this was this was really nice. Uh, working with this group was great because in some ways it was very it was really neat. It was kind of tidy in that they were like, we have this hunch. We don't have the data, can you help us? How can we make sense of this? How can we gather it? What can we do? And then we were able to do that. But in fact, it's not always that easy. And so I have a third space that this project also lives in, and that is in an art space. And I have this piece, which is called The Library of Missing Data Sets. So this is a piece that I show in various places. It mostly consists of a white filing cabinet uh, that has folders inside and each folder is labeled with the title of a missing data set, and the folders inside have nothing in them. They're all empty. And so I show this in a lot of different places. Uh, the previous image that I showed you was from, uh, I think, uh, Amsterdam, and so when I show it there, I try to include data sets that really are relevant to the European and specifically Netherlands, that, those contexts. Uh, but I've also shown this in London, in which case I try to do that except with English, British, and British data. And the same thing when I've shown it here in the States. Try to make it really very specifically tied to where it's being shown. And what is uh, really nice about this piece is that it allows for some of the messiness uh, in a way that I think just is broader, in the sense that you can see, you can see the patterns of this by seeing all of these disparate data sets just pushed up against each other and in this cabinet you begin to see the strange rhythm of all of these missing data sets and the things that some of them seem to have in common. But also, I really, you know, art is a strange space in that you, you can actually watch people interact with your work, which is sometimes very hard and sometimes really rewarding. And something that's really nice is watching people as they kind of come across this, this realization process, where they're like, oh, wait, there are folders, oh, there's nothing in the, oh, they're missing, oh, I see, you know, and you can kind of watch that happen. And that is just a really, a really, uh, really interesting, really fantastic experience. And so I've really enjoyed showing this in different contexts and trying to pull out different, different aspects of that in different ways. And so you could say, with a piece like this, what I'm trying to do is make visible the thing that I talked about towards the beginning, which is this, this, these, these implications of a machine-readable world. Trying to make those graphic, you could say, <laughs> make them visual, uh, make, uh, visualize them in different ways. But, as I'm kind of concluding this, I wanna actually, I've come, come to sort of a different point in thinking about all of these things, which is that when I started doing this project, it was 2016, and we were in a very different moment and context than we are in right now, towards the end of 2018. And so, in an interesting way, this work that I had been doing for a long time of trying to make visible these implications of this machine-readable world, in some ways, it is less important because it is more relevant. 
And I'll, I'll show you what I mean, is that now we see things like this. So we've got the proliferation of AI-based technologies. We're moving into a more and more automated time. Maybe you've seen examples like this. Uh, this is a young East Asian Canadian man who tried to upload his photo to a passport uh, site, and it was deemed as not being appropriate because his eyes were closed, when of course, in fact, his eyes are completely open. Or maybe you've seen an example like this. This is about a beauty contest uh, in which an AI was, uh, was asked to judge it, and then of course it had internalized the biases that exist in our world through its data, and so it judged all of the dark-skinned contestants as being less beautiful than any of the ones that were fairer-skinned. And so things like this, what they have, uh, we're, we're now in this moment, this like proliferation of um, automation-based technologies and decision, uh, automated decision-making technologies, now that we're seeing more and more of these being rolled out, all of a sudden, now we are seeing these, these strange tensions that I was so intent on identifying before are kind of being raised to the surface. And we're seeing them in a more like, mainstream way than we had been seeing them before. Uh, here's another example, we're also seeing um, the combining of a lot of these technologies. So obviously all of you know about CCTV cameras, you know that we've got cameras all around our cities, uh, but in China, uh, recent things have been rolled out so that, you see these, these, these cameras are linked up to facial recognition software so that jaywalkers are immediately recognized and then automatically sent tickets to their home for them to pay. So this is now, what does this mean? We're combining all of these different technologies in other ways and so it's bringing us into this different moment. And the question, what's at the heart of this, is this. Before, I was so interested in the data that we feed to machines and how we take the world and try to make it, like, fit it into, uh, into these different boundaries so that it can be read by machines. And now, all of a sudden, we're dealing with the next step of that, which is that once it's been fed to machines, how are machines and computers and these different systems now seeing us? And what is that doing to us? And what is it, what is it bringing up that we now have to deal with? And so, before I had been really, uh, really concerned with this thing of what's missing, and now I find myself switching and thinking about the structure. What are the terms, the terms of classification? Who gets to decide how the world is classified? Because that's it, in order to feed data to machines, you have to do this thing of putting things into boxes. It has to be quite rigid, it's necessary. Who gets to decide those terms? Because that is what ends up having all of these huge ramifications in the world. And so a lot of my work now has been in trying to deal with, think about that. And so this is, um, this is a piece that I recently have done. It's called Classification 001. And what it consists of is this is a neon bracket. It's a six foot tall bracket. This symbol that I keep on, I keep on uh, showing you looks just like this. And uh, these brackets light up. When they do, they look like that. But they only light up. It's actually hooked up to a camera. It only lights up if more than one person is in front of it. And it only lights up. Uh, so I have a microcontroller hooked to this camera, which is hooked to these brackets, and what I'm doing is running some software of my own, and it's reading in the people who look at it, and it decides if they're similar. And if it classifies you as similar, then it lights up. So then while you're viewing the piece, you've now been sorted into it, and it now has sort of lit up for you. But it won't explain to you why it's lit up, and so you're left to do this work of figuring out what is it that's been classified as similar. Why are you like the person who's standing beside you or the group who you're standing with? And of course, what I'm trying to get at is this, which is this power of classification and how there is so much, there's so much that is inherent in this power. And this, the ability to be able to come up with the terms that the world is classified by is, a, is one of those unseen, this is to me one of the new hidden powers. Um, and lest you think that this is sort of me kind of pulling this out of thin air, um, I remind you that now there are loads of image classification systems that abound. This is an issue, this is a, an image of Gladys Bentley, who was a 1920s Harlem musician, was known for dressing, wearing men's clothing uh, at a time when that was not really approved of or even normalized in any way, shape, or form. And so this is just an image of Gladys Bentley, uh, this woman who I plugged her into this just industry standard image recognition system, and you can see that she is tagged as a man very early on right there. So then, this, this, this tension of what does it mean to be classified and what can you do if you are classified incorrectly? These are the issues that I think we're starting to have to deal with and starting to have to think about. Uh, and so, this is the final thing. Uh, this is probably the most recent thing that I have worked on, which is this guide, it's called A People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. And what this really is coming from is the same thing that I've 
uh, this thing that we've realized of this, the terms of classification, how do you actually, what do you actually do? How do you actually participate in conversations? How do you get, how do you like get some power back in those terms? And uh, I wrote this with a good friend and collaborator, Diana Nussera, and we realized that actually not being able to even speak, oh, uh, well, let me rewind. What happened is that we were spending lots of time in spaces with experts who were talking about the effects of AI and automation and so on, and how this is gonna affect the world. And we realized that these were really closed spaces. And everything that was being said there was that these technologies are going to affect everyone. And we're like, well, everyone's not here. And I'm like, everyone's not really part uh, participating in this conversation. And then we realized that, in fact, uh, Diana works in Detroit. In Detroit, 40% of people still don't have access to the internet. And she was like, how do, you, how do you explain AI to people who can't even get online? And so we said, OK, well, let's try. So we published this booklet. It's called A People's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, you can download it for free online or buy it uh, and get a print copy for $7. And what we do is we go through and we actually try to define all of these, talk about algorithms, we talk about machine learning, we talk about AI in general, and we try to define these things in a way that it makes sense if you're not an expert. Oh uh, yeah, that's the link where you can get it. Uh, it's, and here we do things like we, we talk about examples of AI, talk about what these things are doing in the world. And then of course we also talk about about what it means for these technologies to be in our world as flawed as, flawed as it is, and what, like, how, how does that actually affect us and what can we do? And part of the goal of this, I think, is this question of the terms, who gets to define the terms, which actually is sort of a meta question, I think, of a lot of the work that I do. And this is our little, little stab into trying to say, OK, well, let's see what we can do at bringing more, in, more people into that. And things like this, this is, I think, part of that as well. And so on that note, I will just say, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you for with me. Thank you very much, Mimi. Uh, so we are going to have mics uh, circulating on either side of the theater. Go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll come to you. Please do uh, make sure to speak clearly into the mics so that everyone can hear. Why don't we start right down here in front? Hi. Uh, thank you. My question is, is going to be difficult for me to uh, formulate, but. There are advantages for the people who have the data, and there are advantages for the people, uh, meaning who, who have the, possess the data, and there are advantages for the individuals. Um, my question has to do with how do we communicate to individuals where and how it's advantageous for the individual to share information mm -hmm. without, uh, I mean, everybody's concerned about privacy, et cetera, but there are many cases where if you give up the information, you have a lot to gain by it at some point, maybe not always, but any tips for that? Right, I think that's such a good question. Um, in some ways, there are a lot of academics who have talked about how our previous models about privacy have just fallen apart, and this, like this, like they're like, oh, we're lifting models that we had from previous times and trying to apply it to this time, it doesn't work. Uh, but one of I have a good friends, Ara Rahman, who's a great researcher, and something that she and I always say to each other is that, networked problems demand collective solutions. So exactly what you're saying, there are moments where it's really advantageous for groups to kind of come together and think about how their data is being used. But I think that what gets at this is this, this question of ownership and possession and who is in charge and how that's being, like who, again, who, has, who controls the terms becomes extra important. And I think the best examples I can see actually are in Detroit where uh, there's a center called the Detroit Community Technology Project, and they have collectively as a group come up with rules for any company that wants to come to Detroit and use the data of the people there has to sign a contract that the people have collectively created where they're like, this is what's going to happen to our data. This is how long it's going to live. This is uh, where we can access it. This is just all of the terms for it. And so if you want to work with them as a third party company, you have to sign that. And so that, I think, is, I think it levels that field and it gets at exactly what you're talking about. We have a question up here on the left. Hi, I think one of the most interesting things you kind of struck on was how data can sometimes become discriminatory and like the way that it's collected, the way that it's used and analyzed. You know, I think data in itself is a neutral thing, but it, you know, depending on the user and what you use it for, it can, you know, obviously take a different life. And so how, I guess, what would you recommend, you know, even from someone who collects that data or someone in the public policy world or even like an average citizen to like overcome that barrier because, you know, it obviously comes from an implicit bias within us all. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, that question is actually huge. I think that's the question that so many people are trying to figure out right now. So 
I think it's, there's the data, but then there's also what the data is used for. And so the first thing is that, of course, I think a lot of the work I had been doing initially was about just collecting the data and how that in itself, that's an act. And just reminding, like realizing that that is an act and that, that like, there are things that kind of can happen from that becomes important. But now I think what we're seeing a lot of, because all this data is being fed into various algorithms that are used for various purposes, uh, now you've got this thing where a lot of companies can say, we don't want to share the algorithm for this because it's like proprietary information. So then that becomes this thing that disempowers a lot of people because you're like, well, I don't know actually what this stuff is being used for. And now I know I'm going to be sold something or I know it's going to be, my data is going to be sold for people, but I, I have no control over where it goes. And so this, now I think there are a lot of people who are fighting for transparency in different ways. Uh, also for just in general, I think this like reinsertion of ethics into computer science and related fields. So this like this question of neutrality I work, now I work in an engineering school, and this, for, we always come back to this of like, is it neutral? Is, you know, and it's like, the answer is no. <laughs> it's very easy, but it's actually super hard, even when I'm talking with my engineering students, for us to tease apart like, no, this comes from a context, from a context. This, this data is local. It has meaning in this space. But once you have it, once you create any data set, it can be used in any way. It doesn't matter how you created it. Now it just can live for any way, uh, live and somebody can take it and then do what they want with it. I think a good example is the, you know, the Roomba, our little like favorite uh, vacuum cleaner machine. Uh, there was this kind of outcry because they were like, yeah, actually we've been collecting data on your houses and what they look like and we're gonna sell it to Apple. Me, we don't know what it's for, but we think it's worth something. Like we live in a world where it always is advantageous to just collect data and then you find the use for it afterwards. And so also, this idea of uh, being able to limit how long a data set can live anywhere, I think that is super crucial. It's really important. And we've got a question right down here, Mimi. Yeah, so my question was basically, um, so how much of this missing data is um, being hidden on purpose? In other words, mm. and then also about legal, you know, kind of um, like legal terms, like can you hide data? I mean, what data is, what data do you have to publish openly? Because I know there's been some like open data projects, I think, in the yeah. past and everything. Oh yeah, that's such a good question. So the thing that's super interesting about the Missing Data Project is that this is kind of a framework that I've now created, uh, and that I'm like, okay, these things are missing, and, but some of the things are not actually, like they're there, it's just that we can't access it. And that's really intentional on my part, and that I'm, I wanna say, no, we should be able to access these things, but we really can't. And so I would say a lot of stuff, there's a lot of stuff that is hidden on purpose, not everything. There are, as I said, I, you know, I listed these different reasons. There are some things where it's like, it's just hard for us to collect it. Like the ways that we collected weather data in the past mean that we can't have very accurate historical weather data for all, region, for all regions, for all moments. That is like a technical kind of, kind of problem you could say. Uh, but then there's also stuff that is really very deeply, uh, there are a lot of stories we found in like data that is, in, that is like, pack, uh, like, it's a good example is PDFs. Uh, so, a lot of, I had this really great project, it didn't go anywhere, but did a lot of really great interviews with people, with lawyers and various governmental agencies where people admitted that they would put stuff in PDFs because PDF as a, as, as a file, it's not one that programmers can really easily work with. And so if you can put a lot of information online in PDFs that are hard for people to get it out of, you've now, you're like, oh yeah, the data is there. But actually it's hard, it's like hard for people to get it. And so there, are, you see this all the time. There are loads of strategies that are that are employed to kind of have something so that it's open but not really open, or as you as you're kind of hinting at that it just doesn't really like it's there but it's not. So this this happens quite a bit, and I think it is important. This is why I think it's so so important for us to bring up this context of how how a data set is created because then that gets at the fact that there is a choice. Like somebody wants something to exist. Also, somebody cannot want something to exist. And when we're at least gonna be evaluating these data sets, let's, pull, let's bring this up there, so then it's not just a question of is it neutral, is it objective, whatever, but who brought that into being and for what purpose? We have a question up here in the back left. Cool. Thank you. Um, following up on that, I'm curious as to sort of how you position this work and these questions of you know, dispossessions of data and, and absences of data to like absencings of data. So not just that it's missing, but maybe that it's also disappearing. Mm. Um, so like we have the government sort of starting to hide certain types of environmental data, uh, you know, sexual and reproductive health data. And so sort of the role of now people as archivists sort of trying to sort of step in and, and protect this type of data. 
Um, is that related to these types of questions? Um, what sort of what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, yeah, I find this very much tied to the whole practices of art, just archiving in general, and thinking about archiving institutional memory, permanence, which also ties into the general, like the internet as a strange, or the web really, as a space where things can curiously live forever or be gone very quickly. You know that both of those realities can exist at the same time. I, for the purpose of this project, I group all, I kind of group those together. I say if something is being removed, I'm like, yeah, that's missing. That's missing data. And I, like I said, I kind of have this norm, there's a normative clause that's sort of implied in the project where I'm like, yeah, this isn't here, but it should be. There's a problem, like there's a reason why. It's not that it just fell off the face of the earth, but there is an intention. There's somebody or some entity's intention behind that. So yeah, I think that that is very important as another kind of section, like another segment of the project. Great, we've got a question right down here. Is it good to investigate implicit or explicit bias among people that decide what data to use or, or not go after or missing that, that we're not doing? Like, for example, I think that some uh, of our uh, police intelligence organizations have a right-wing bias, but they don't uh, come out and say so. Yeah, so I think this gets us into this really what your question reminds me of is, I talked about, you know, in this presentation, I was talking about how, in some ways, these, like, biases we're seeing turn up in various artifacts. So now we can say, okay, look, this thing was made, uh, look how Google's image search algorithm tagged black people as gorillas, like, that's messed up, that's a problem. We can see that as a result of not having enough data in this way and blah, blah, blah. So we're seeing those, like, artifacts emerge where we can get at some of those implicit biases that we couldn't see before, but the thing, the problem I find, the like catch-22 of it all, is that that process still uh, prioritizes the biases that we can count and the ones that we can track. And we still have this huge thing where not, there is a lot of stuff that is not able to be tracked. And as long as we keep on being like, look, look, now we can see it, we can point to it, we can measure that, it still allows the vast amount of things that happen that you can't really track, the vast amount of experiences, like you said, these biases that we know are doing something, but we can't point to how, it still allows them to, to thrive. And in fact, it reminds me of a lot of research that's been done about open data and transparency. It talks about how actually, when you like enforce this on a department or on a local government, it doesn't make things more transparent, it just makes things more creatively hidden. And so this, like, this is the issue. I think this is the moment that we're trying to figure out. And I don't have a good answer for it. It's a thing that I think about a lot. And I think it's right there. It's right, like, that question you asked is so nice because it brushes up right against it. And I, I just, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I think it's something that we do need to be talking about and trying to figure out. And in a lot of camps, there's this, uh, it's seductive to be able to talk a lot of people, there are groups, like there are some conferences like FAT, Fairness uh, and Transparency and Algorithms or Machine Learning, if somebody remembers the name of that, let me know. Uh, and that conference happens every year, it's in New York, and there are increasingly measures to try to, how can we like measure fairness? And I find that that is like, quite potentially useful and also potentially dangerous because then it's like, we do the same thing, it's only if we can measure it that it will matter. And what I'm kind of trying to push for is like, we have to accept all of this and think about why it is that certain thing, like why we prioritize the things that can be measured. Well, how, what does that do with the things that can't be and never will be? We have a question here on the right. Uh, so a uh, follow up to that point about trusting the data once we have it, um, because, because there's so much data out there, how do you know what's uh, accurate and what's not as you kind of take that in and, and, and use it uh, to prove a point or not a point. Mm. Yeah, so this is sort of, I think, so there are some groups, I'm trying to think, I'll have to, you'll have to give me a minute, if I can remember it afterwards, because it's not coming to mind, but there are some groups that have really great kind of strategies, like this is how you know if you can trust it. Oh, I think the Responsible Data Forum, they do a whole thing where they're like, this is what makes something trustworthy or not. Uh, in some ways, it kind of is like on a case-by-case -case basis where you can like look at, you can tell, you're like, okay, how was this collected, who is collecting it, et cetera. But this, this question, I think, is so big because, like I said, this, when, you, when you just consider data as data and you're like, oh, it exists, it doesn't matter why it was collected, that is what gets you into these places where you don't, it doesn't matter whether it's accurate because it's there. And this is, you, I mean, we would be surprised how much, how much of the reasons why people use certain data sets is because it's there. Or like for me, as a, as a professor, like working with students, I'll be like, why did you choose 
why did you choose to do this project based on people on Twitter? And you're saying that it's everybody in the world. And they're like, yeah, but you can get Twitter data really easily. So you know that does, it does a lot of work. It does. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry, that's kind of, <laughs> that's where we're at. Hmm. Okay, any other questions out there? We have a question on the left. I'm Thank you, it. Kelly. Hi, um, I'm a librarian, so of course I work a lot with classification. And um, you referred a little to this about um, the bias that's inherent in classification. And of course, for years we've worked with a very um, hierarchical and very antiquated classification system. But now we're seeing more crowdsourcing of classification as well as crowdsourcing of collecting data. And so for example, tagging, you talked about the photo that had been tagged, but in Amazon and in just cattle, in, clothing cataloging, people are actually doing, creating their own classification mm -hmm. system. So I wondered if you could comment on that and how that's changing uh, the, the validity of data. Yeah, that's great. First off, love librarians doing that hard work. <laughs> that's right. Um, this, yeah, okay, so I love that you brought this point up because in fact, in this conversation that we're having about machine learning, machine learning branch of art, uh, artificial intelligence, really about being able to see patterns in data, usually so that you can predict what will happen. And so you see a lot of examples of this, like you said, on Amazon, recommendation systems, or on YouTube when you watch a video and it's like, don't you wanna now watch everything ever done about this exact topic? Like you see, you see a lot of this. And something that gets really erased from that story is this human labor that is at one side of it, so in order for machine learning uh, systems and algorithms to work, you have to have so much data. And it has to be classified right, it has to be tagged right. And so there are sites that exist. Um, which one now? I think it's called Figure 8 is a really great one actually. Uh, and they, and all, so many of these big tech companies that, are, that can do these machine learning initiatives, they use Figure 8. And what it does is you can go there and you can, you can get paid as a person to just do these like, very rote classification tasks. So you are cleaning up the data that will be, the data sets that will be used by these companies. So there's this huge labor that is implied in this. Uh, and this, you see this all over the place. Google does the same thing. Google set up these stores in New York uh, one time where they were like, here, get a free donut. And like, like start, try speaking to our, uh, our like voice uh, whatever system. And of course, what you're doing is training that system. So you're giving them free data so that they can train it. But they're not saying that. They're like, here, try our new product. And so you're just doing that work as like we're all doing that labor collectively and it just gets ignored completely. This is so much the way that all of these systems work. There's this very like human action that's, that's built into it that isn't really rewarded, isn't acknowledged, and isn't um, really properly like compensated at all, but is at the heart of all of these machine learning systems in particular. So this, and I think it is, I just, the, the piece, the, that image, that I showed you uh, is actually from a piece that I wrote about this exact thing that's happening. Uh, and it was kind of like use, contrasting it and using the story glass belly to bring it up. But this, that the task of classification, it is algorithmic now, of course, but also is very human. And now is increasingly kind of between, like going back and forth between the two in a way that is still on the terms of companies that have power to kind of decide how they want to do it. But it's so much a part of this story that I don't think it's spoken about very much. We have time for just one more question. Go ahead and raise your hand and we'll come to you. You got her, Kelly? Thank you. I'm glad you put that uh, figure back up. Here is a person who purposely set out to pose as a man. Um, it's, it's a large person. It seems to me that the defining that the algorithm, in fact, did exactly what the person who disguised herself, if you will, wanted it to do. Uh, so it, it looks as though, I mean, most of the people sitting here in the audience, if you were asked, is that a male or a female? It might be a bit of question, but chances are we would say, it looks like a man. So we will classify it as a, as a man. Um, how, does, how does the algorithm take into consideration all the multiple, multiple kinds of variables that, you know, we can slice and dice forever. Mm. Uh, at what point you say, ah, we can't go any further with this. Right, okay, that's, that's good. Um, so, in a way, well, to begin with, I would say that she wasn't really trying to, to, be, to like, 
confuse anybody or try to parade as a man. She was just like, this is how I like to dress. And it's kind of weird that I can't and that that's regarded as like cross-dressing even. Like, why can't I just dress in this way? And so really what the question is, I think, is about what happens when you exist in these weird in-between spaces where you don't fall into the categories? And I think we've seen this play out in a lot of ways. You see this, like Facebook, Facebook has just gone through kind of like uh, situation after situation where it's like, what about this real name policy is not, you know, Facebook has this policy where they say you have to have your real name, you can't use any fake names. But then in the process of trying to screen for these, they've done things like uh, some na like Native American names, they've been like, no, nah, that's a fake name, that's not your real name. Or like uh, drag queens, they're like, no, 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 that's not your name. And they're like, this is the name that I go, what do you mean? What is my real name? And so this, I think it's so interesting. When I was doing the missing data set project, people would ask me, how, how do you find these data sets? And I was always like, people know. Because if you have a need for something, and you, like those Broadway performers, they're like, we have a need to know, and we can't get it. People always know where there's missing data, because they've been dealing with it their whole lives. And I think the corollary to that when thinking about classification systems is that the people who you talk to are the ones who are in between. Anybody who's kind of, or who feel like they don't fit, those are the people who reveal the structure of the entire system. Great. Right, and that's all the time that we have. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you.